Motion tracking is an essential aspect of many VFX shots. Whether you're turning your actor into a cyborg or adding a computer-generated prop into your actor's hand. Hello everyone, I'm Zach and welcome back to another tutorial. We often use Blender to complement our hit film VFX tutorials, and tracking something in the scene is usually the first step. Today we'll be taking a detailed look at 3D tracking in Blender, so you can create some cool VFX to be composited in hit film. When you record your video footage, make sure the object you want to track has some trackable features. When tracking someone's face, we like to draw these tracking dots, but you just need some sort of detail that the tracker can lock onto. Before we even open Blender, it's a good idea to process our video footage before tracking it. This clip was shot in log, so it looks very flat. I'll bring the video into hit film. Then I'll add a curves effect to bring some contrast back into the image. I'll add a little more contrast, increase the saturation, and add some sharpening. This makes our video easier to see and can help the tracking process lock onto the details better. Now we can export our video as a PNG image sequence. Make sure to create a new folder for all the images. Your footage doesn't have to be an image sequence to work in Blender, but I find that it works the best. Open up Blender and create a new file using the VFX template. This sets up our workspace with everything we need for motion tracking. Click open and navigate to your video clip to load it in. Over in the output properties, let's set our resolution and frame rate to match the video file. Click set scene frames to make your Blender project the same duration as your video. Then click the prefetch button. This will load your footage into memory so it can play back smoothly. Our footage is all set up in Blender, so let's begin tracking. I'll start with the default tracking settings. Control click to add a tracker, then open up the track tab so we can better monitor the tracking process. The E key brings up the tracking menu, so let's track forward. The track stopped before reaching the end of the shot. We can reposition the tracker on its last good frame and track again from there. Nice! It made it to the end and it seems to be sticking well. Press Ctrl L to lock it, preventing any accidental adjustments. The next track goes all the way to the end. If you find these motion trails are getting in the way, you can go to the clip display menu and hide the track paths. This next track stops early, so I'll delete it by pressing X. Let's see what settings we can adjust to make it track the whole shot. Normalize can sometimes help if the lighting in your footage changes over time. Setting the match type to previous frame can really help if the shape of your tracking markers change over time. Now the tracker makes it all the way to the end and it looks good. Pattern size and search size are the same as the red and green boxes when motion tracking in hit film. You can display the search box from the clip display menu. If the motion you are tracking is very fast, you may need to increase the search size. These tracking settings only apply to the trackers we add next, not the tracker we currently have selected. You can adjust its settings from the menu on the other side. While I'm tracking, I don't really watch the main viewport. I pay more attention to the small track window which stays centered on the tracker, making it easy to see if it drifts off course. I want this tracker to be a bit bigger. Instead of adjusting the pattern and search size, you can scale it by hitting S. This is good for a few select trackers, but if you find that they all need to be a different size, you should change the settings beforehand. I've gone ahead and tracked all the easy points that are always visible. The rest of the markers disappear and then reappear later on. When I track this one, it goes to the end, but doesn't do a good job as it starts sliding off the marker. Find the last frame where it's still good, then press E and clear the track path to disable the tracker before it goes wonky. If we deselect all with Alt-A, the tracker is still visible while disabled. You can hide the disabled trackers from the clip display menu. Here I have two separate tracks, one that was tracked forward for the start, and one that was tracked backwards for the end but they are on the same marker. With one selected, we can shift select the other, then go to track, join tracks. Now they have been combined into one track that starts active, disables, then reactivates. Cool. Repeat this process to track all the other markers. Before solving and turning these 2D tracks into a 3D object, I like to adjust the 3D camera. Right now, the camera position and orientation doesn't make sense compared to our footage. I'll add a layout workspace to make it easier to work in 3D. Then I'll select the camera and adjust its location and rotation to roughly match the camera we filmed with. There! Much better! 
To solve our object, we need at least eight trackers at all times. We have a lot more than eight in this case, so that leaves room to delete some trackers if they are lower quality or causing problems later on. If we look at our objects, we've actually added all these trackers to a camera, but we're not doing a camera solve. Select the camera, then press A to select all the trackers. Unlock them with Alt-L, then copy them. Click the plus button to add an object. Paste the trackers and lock them again. Then delete them from the camera. Of course, you could just add an object first and avoid this cutting and pasting step. If you know the sensor size of your camera and the focal length of your lens, you should enter them in here. The solve will still work without providing this information, but it's an easy step for more accuracy. Now we're ready to solve our object. Go to the Solve tab and click Solve Object Motion. We can see that our solve error is 0.53 pixels, which is quite good. Anything less than 1 is a pretty good place to be. You can reduce the solve error by setting the keyframes. Find the frames that show the most parallax between points, and that best represent the motion of the object. I'll set mine to the frames before and after this rotation. In this case, the error is the same, but in other projects, choosing good keyframes made a huge improvement. Another way to reduce the error is to delete trackers with a higher error. In the clip display menu, you can enable info, which shows the average error on the selected tracker. Delete tracks with errors much higher than the rest. This one on the eyebrow likely has a higher error because the eyebrow moves independently from the head. Deleting that tracker and solving again, our error is reduced. Nice. With our solve looking good, we can now apply it to a 3D object. Add a camera solver constraint to the camera. Even though we aren't tracking any camera movement, this is needed to show the tracking marks in the 3D viewport. Now we can see where the object is in 3D space relative to the camera. Adjust the object scale setting to place it the right distance away. Since I placed my camera 2 meters away from the origin, and Kirsty was about 2 meters away from the camera while filming, I know my object should be roughly at the world center. In the geometry dropdown, click 3D markers to mesh. This creates a 3D object representing the track points. You can hide the tracker overlay from the viewport now if it's in the way. Looking at the object in 3D, it seems to make sense as the points match the curvature of a human face. This is a good sign. If your points don't make sense, you may need to improve your solve. Click the Set as Background button to see your footage through the 3D camera. I'll increase their opacity to make them easier to see. Our object still doesn't follow the tracked movement. Add an Object Solver constraint, select the camera and object, then click Set Inverse. Now we can see our 3D object moving and rotating in 3D space, and the movement looks good and makes sense based on the footage. Cool! Let's add a custom 3D model into the shot to make use of the tracking data. This Iron Man helmet model is free to download from BlendSwap.com, link in the description. Since it's a Blender file, we need to append it instead of importing. The model comes in with some rotation animation, so I'll clear those keyframes. We now need to position, scale, and rotate the model to line it up with the tracking markers and our video. Going into wireframe view can help with the alignment process. With the model roughly lined up, shift select a tracked object and parent the model to the track with Ctrl P. Now we can go throughout the shot and refine the placement of the model. We can see that the model is tracked in nicely, but some of Kirsty's ear, hair, and hat stick out around the helmet. That can be easily fixed in HitFilm with some simple compositing after we export out of Blender. Once you are happy with your Blender animation, you can bring it over to HitFilm to create a final VFX shot. If you're using HitFilm Express without the 3D model add-on, you can render an image sequence out of Blender to be combined with your footage in HitFilm. This 3D model came with some materials already set up, so you just need to add some lighting before you render. Check out the tutorial linked in the card on screen to learn more about using Blender with HitFilm Express. If you want even more control over your 3D scene without having to re-render out of Blender, you can export the 3D animation over to HitFilm. You'll first need to install the free Blender to HitFilm exporter linked in the video description. With a track object selected, you can export to a HitFilm composite shot. This will bring our 3D camera and our 3D object motion data into HitFilm. Next, we need to export the 3D model itself. I'll make sure the Iron Man helmet objects are selectable. Then with the object selected, export as an OBJ file. 
Make sure to check selection only so no unwanted objects are included. Open up HitFilm and import the composite shot, bringing in the camera and track 3D point. Then import the 3D model. You can adjust the materials now or later, but make sure to enable any animation groups if you plan to animate separate parts of the model in HitFilm. For more info on importing 3D models into HitFilm, check out the tutorial linked in the card on screen. Make sure to uncheck Center Anchor Point and Auto Normalize Scale to ensure that the 3D model will line up with our 3D scene properly. Drag the model onto the timeline and parent it to the 3D point. If we drag in our footage underneath, everything seems to line up nicely. Cool! We've successfully brought our tracked object from Blender into HitFilm. To remove and clean up the areas outside the helmet, you'll need a clean plate, meaning footage without the actor in the frame. Our footage was longer than the final clip, and since Kirsty moved during the shot, I was able to extract enough of the background behind her without needing a separate clean plate. I then applied masks to these exported frames to cover the unwanted areas. Now it looks like Kirsty is wearing the helmet instead of it being stuck over top. To take this shot to the next level, you can set up proper materials and lighting on the 3D model. You can also add additional effects like glow on the eyes, and can blend the digital model with the video footage with color correction, blur, and grain. Tie the whole shot together and finish it off with a color grade. A solid 3D track from Blender combined with compositing and effects in HitFilm can result in some epic VFX. Check out these other tutorials to learn more about the HitFilm and Blender combination. Leave a comment and hit the like button if you learned something new. Remember to subscribe for more tutorials like this. See you next time!